Thank you for joining us for another power-packed message from Dr. Miles Monroe, provided by Monroe Global Incorporated and MonroeGlobal.com. We transform followers into leaders and leaders into agents of change. We hope that this message is a blessing to you as you advance your life and discover your purpose. Now, let's go into the message. The church was created to explode. It's true. The church was created to move things, not to be moved. The church was created to, to change things and not to be changed by things. Apparently, the church has become so weak that even politics changes it. It has become so weak that even social problems change the church. The church is supposed to be the ones that set the pace not the world setting the pace for them. It seems as if we have become so void of, of the real dynamic power of the Holy Spirit until we have to do what the world does to feel like we fit in. I tell you what, I don't want to fit in. And if I'm different, I'm proud. Because the Bible says we are not of this world. Now the Holy Spirit was given so that the church could be that force. The Holy Spirit, its very nature, means power. The gift of the Holy Spirit has to do with the battle that we go through to be a Christian on earth. The baptism in the Holy Spirit is given not to get us to heaven, but to help us live on earth. The baptism in the Holy Spirit, its whole purpose is power. Now, it has been given to help us meet the needs of others. Every gift that God gave to you was not for you. Do you know that? That's why God doesn't have too much interest in bless me clubs. You know, little folks get together and just say, Lord, bless me, bless me, bless me. No, when the Lord blesses you, he blesses you to equip you to go and bless somebody else who don't have any blessing. Jesus said, freely ye have received, freely give. You are receiving to give. The Holy Spirit in Acts chapter 1 verse 8 as recorded there, it is a power of explosiveness. And it is given to open up the inner man, that is our spirit, to a better relationship and communion with God so that we can operate in the world against the devil. Now, what is the baptism in the Holy Spirit? We hear a lot about it. It is a baptism. It is a coming up. It is a filling up. It is an overflow. It is a soaking. The Holy Ghost takes you and soaks your spirit with himself. It's one thing to drink water. It's a different thing to pour a bucket over your head. Some folks receive the Spirit inside, but they never let him just dunk them. The baptism in the Holy Spirit is a release of the person of the Spirit in power. Let us look first at the word baptism then real quickly. What does it mean to be baptized? You may want to write some things down. I would encourage you to take some notes today. The Greek word for baptism is baptismal. That word baptism, they couldn't find any other word uh, to translate it because it is so unique in its meaning that they had to use the very same Greek word in English. Baptismal, baptism. Baptism or baptismal simply has three meanings. One, it has a mechanical meaning. And that means to take a piece of cloth and to dip it in a dye until every fiber in that cloth was changed to the color of the dye. In those days, they called that baptism. So you would take a white sheet and go over to some red dye in a tub and put the white sheet in the tub. Now if you put the sheet in the tub but some parts of it were not changed and you took it out, you could not say that sheet was baptized. Baptized means every fiber has been influenced. That's the mechanical meaning of the word. 
In those days, they also used the word to describe it in a ceremonial sense. This is when the, the soldiers would take a sword that they were making and they would melt, melt the metal until the metal would become completely fluid. Then they would shape it into the form of a sword and they would beat it until it becomes flat and very sharp. Then they would take that hot sword that is glowing with heat and they would baptize it into a cold tub of water. And all you would hear is they would call that baptism. Now the ceremony of that sword is this. Every time a soldier would use a sword in battle, he would fight with it and he would get chips and become dull. So he would go back to the fire. Holy Ghost is fire. And he would take the sword and shove it into the furnace and leave it there until the sword becomes soft again. Then he would pull it out and he would beat it sharp again with a mall. Then he would go into the water and baptize it again. Then it become like a new sword. Paul says, be being baptized with the Holy Spirit. That means get baptized every day in the Holy Spirit. Some folks believe, well, I got it in 1963. Oh no, you got baptized in 1963 on that day. Paul says, be being filled with the Holy Spirit. That means be filled every day. Get baptized every day. Go into the fire and get your shape back. And then go into the Holy Word and get all dumped. And come back out sharp again, cutting like the two-edged sword of the Word. When the devil sees you, he'll say, that's a sharp one. Some folks got baptized in 63 in the Holy Ghost. And that's why ain't nothing happening to them today. Because they become dull. Third meaning of baptism is a metaphorical meaning. And that means a substance of material that soaks something up. A sponge. You would take a sponge and put it in water and the sponge would be called baptized because the sponge soaks in everything that was around it. Now when we talk about being baptized in the Holy Spirit then, we have a picture in our minds of what happens to us. The Holy Spirit is a person, but the baptism in the Holy Spirit is a dimension of that person. God wants to touch every fiber of your life. Just like the sheep would be soaked with every single fiber of that dye. God wants every molecule of our being to be influenced by his spirit. You see, you could drink water but still not be wet. A lot of folks have received the Holy Spirit in salvation, but they've never gotten wet by him all over. The person of the Holy Spirit will guarantee that you get to heaven. But the baptism in the Holy Spirit will guarantee that you're going to make it on earth. One gets you to heaven, the other one equips you to live here. God promised us this power then. And in, Mark, in Acts chapter 1 verse 8, it talks about that power. Before we get to that power, let's turn to Mark chapter, chapter 1. Sorry, Acts chapter 1, verse 8. You get the right one. Jesus said in Acts chapter 1, verse, verse 8, And ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, unto all the other parts of the earth. Now notice the word in that verse 8, ye shall receive power, ye shall be baptized in the Holy Ghost. Is the word baptized there? Ye shall receive the Holy Spirit. John says that I see one coming after me. He shall baptize you in the Holy Spirit. Now let's turn to Mark chapter 1 verse 8. John began to preach and in Mark chapter 1 verse 8 he began to talk about Jesus and here's what he says about Jesus he said there is one that's coming after me 
Mark chapter 1, verse 8. I indeed baptize you with water, but there, but there cometh one after me, he shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost. And Luke adds, and with fire. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. Now notice the word baptize. A lot of folks says, well, you receive the baptism when you get saved. John didn't say that. John speaks of the outer man being baptized in water, but he speaks of another inner man being baptized by the Holy Ghost. It is the releasing and the flooding of one's entire being by the Spirit of God. That's what baptism in the Holy Spirit is. It means having the, the life of the Spirit released in your being. Now in Acts chapter 1 verse 8, we find these words. Ye shall receive power after the Holy Ghost baptizes you. The Greek word for power, please write this down, is the word dunamis. D-U-N-A-M-I-S. That's the Greek word, dynamis. It's the way we get our Latin word from, dynominus, which is the English word, dynamite. Jesus was actually saying, when the Holy Ghost come upon you, you shall receive dynamite. Let me tell you something. Dynamite is explosive power. Dynamite, the very nature of dynamite is to move things. I don't care how big the mountain is, put a couple small sticks of dynamite in it and something's gonna move. Now you may look small and insignificant, but you got a dynamite in you. I wanna tell you something. Jesus said, you shall receive power. Dynamus, dynamite. Now what is dynamite? Dynamite is stored power. Let's just say we have a stick of dynamite. It's, have you ever seen dynamite? It's just like a firecracker, but a big firecracker. Just one red stick with a little wick on the top. Now, that's dynamite. You could take the dynamite, put it in your pocket, and walk all around town and say, guess what, I've got dynamite. You could go on the radio and preach, I've got dynamite. You can go on the television and say, look, I've got dynamite. You could write books about what you've got. But guess what? That's all you got, dynamite. Dynamite is potential power. Dynamite is stored energy. Many Christians are just walking sticks of dynamite. They have never been touched by the fire of the Holy Ghost to make them explode with the power of God. Jesus said, when the Holy Ghost comes upon you, then you shall receive power. Now you're going to see a good picture then. Every Christian had received the Holy Spirit. The disciples, when Jesus said these words, had already received the stick, the person, the Holy Spirit. In John chapter 20 and 21, when he was leaving, he began to explain to them. And he says, he breathed on them and they received the Holy Spirit. They received the stick, the person, the, 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 the power of the Trinity that was the, was the reality of God. But they... We're just walking around with sticks of dynamite. If you are a Christian, and there are millions of them today that are saved, but they've never exploded. And so the devil, he comes to them and he threatens them. And then they walk around like some folks say, uh, <clears throat> you better leave me alone, you don't know what I got. Man, I got dynamite. The devil says, <laughs> big deal. You don't know how to use it. Isn't that something? It's like you having a gun, and a guy comes to shoot you, and you hold the gun at him, and you say, if you shoot me, I'll shoot you. Now, that's a foolish thing to say, because if he shoots you, how are you going to shoot? <laughs> if he comes to threaten your life and to kill you, and you don't know how to use the gun, you've never learned how to explode it, then you're in trouble, because you could say all night, I got a gun, man, you better leave me alone, I got a gun. The guy keeps walking to you, and you keep saying, I've got a gun, I've got a gun, and he keeps walking to you, I've got a gun, man, I got a gun. Hey, I got a gun, you know. And he walks right up against the wall, and you say, I've got a gun. I've got a gun. Can't you see I've got a gun? And he slaps you. 
And you say, I've got a gun. That's just how some of us live. Devil can't, you know, the devil pushes us in the corner and then beats us all side our heads. He puts sickness on our family, steals our finances, gives us depression, heartache, headaches, all kinds of things. And we stand there saying, I'm a child of God, you know. Jesus said, when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, it's going to bring dynamite. And ye shall receive power. Now Jesus then is talking about not just having a stick of dynamite, but getting it released. Now, how do you get dynamite released? A simple process. You take some fire and you put it at the wick and then you run. <laughs> the disciples were standing there in the upper room. Can't you see them? Sticks of dynamite. Hallelujah. Glory to Yahweh. Jesus is Lord. All of a sudden, you a wind. And they saw flames. How do you light dynamite? Flames. And the Bible says it's as if it came upon their heads. And all of a sudden, <laughs> something went off inside Peter. And Peter just started, he didn't know what to do. He just started, just started praising the Lord. All of a sudden, John started, Mark started, then Mary too. 120 of them. They just exploded. And the minute they got that explosion, they went outside and they started preaching. 3,000 folks got saved because there was a power now. They walked up to the city gate and yanked a man up who was crippled for years. Then they went on down to old, uh, old, old what's his name, Ananias' house. Sat down there and preached and all the folks started speaking in tongues just by Peter preaching. You see, you could work all year to save 3,000. But all you got to do is get filled with the Holy Spirit. You can do that in three days. The power of God exploded in their lives. Now, why does God then talk about dynamite? Because God's church is a church of power. One of the things that turned me off when I was growing up as a, as a Baptist, was that I loved the Baptist church. I, was, I grew up in there most of my life, and, and God knows I loved the Baptist church. But there wasn't any power. I would read the Bible, and it would say, you know, heal the sick, raise the dead, cast out demons. And then folks would take, you know, uh, go home and take fencing. I was looking for power. Not selfishly, but I wanted to know this thing was real. I mean, if God says it's, it's a powerful church, it's a powerful church. So it must have been something I was missing. And that's when I got baptized in the Holy Ghost. Let's turn to John chapter 1, verse 12. And while you're turning there, stop off in Romans chapter 1, verse 16. Romans chapter 1, verse 16 says, The gospel is the power of God unto salvation. The gospel is a power gospel. It's not just words. John chapter 1 verse 12. It says, And as many as believed him, to them gave he power to become sons of God. A lot of folks think that means the Holy Ghost. It doesn't. The word power there means authority. It's not talking about the same power in Acts chapter 1 verse 8. This is the power of authority or rights. It's like you having the right to be a citizen of your country. You got the authority to say, I am a Bahamian. Everywhere you go, you can say, I am a Bahamian. And they're going to ask you, well, now, how do you know you are a Bahamian? I was born in the Bahamas. He has my passport to prove it. That's authority. Now, the Bible says, those who believe in Jesus have the authority, the right to say, I am a child of God. But it does not mean that they are experiencing the power to prove what they say. So in Acts chapter 1 verse 8, Jesus is saying, here's another kind of power. This power denotes explosive, enabling power. So John chapter 1 verse 12 says, I am a son of God. Acts chapter 1 verse 8 says, watch me prove it. It's two kinds of power. Second point I want to bring out from Acts chapter 1 verse 8. Let's turn back there. It says, And ye shall be witnesses unto me. 
Now there is a terrible division in the church today. I mean there are more denominations than there are people. Do you know why? Because this is caused by Christians who have become witnesses to little petty minor values rather than witnesses unto Jesus. They have become more concerned about the minors and so they major on the minors. These divisions have come about because little petty values that people believe would separate them, like don't wear lipstick. And I mean they build their religion on what they don't wear rather than build it on who they are, sons of God. They are more concerned about how you look rather than who you are. And that divides the church, continually divides the church. They have become absorbed in ideas that are peculiar to them only, rather than the Word of God. Well, we don't wear long dresses. Uh, well, we don't wear short dresses. Oh, well, you know we don't do those things. And they just go on and tell you all this, what they don't do. Things that are peculiar to them. I mean, there are some folks who would say, well, we don't have music in our church. And others say, well, we don't, we don't uh, be speaking tongues in our church. And they just separate themselves by these little insignificant values. Jesus said, when the Holy Ghost come upon you, ain't going to be no room for values. He's going to fill you with the power of God, and you're just going to be a witness. Yeah. Some people say, uh, you're not a good witness. And you say, uh, well, why? Because you're wearing chains and, and earrings, and, and hey, hey, you got the wrong point, my brother. It's not what you wear that makes you a witness. Jesus says, you're going to be a witness. The trouble is, anyone who tries to witness to the truth can never do it completely. Why? Because the truth is a person. You understand what I'm saying? Somebody say, well, I'm a witness to the truth. How do you know? Well, I don't wear this. I don't do this. I don't go there. I don't go there. That doesn't tell me anything. All it tells me is you'd like to go, but you don't. Come on. I remember when I was in the choir, in the Baptist church. Man, they said, don't go to the movies. And boy, every movie that came along, I used to just look at it and lust. Oh, I'd love to see that. Oh, Tarzan. Man, I'd love to go see that. I wonder how, and you began to just imagine. Some of them I'd pass the theater, and look at it, and then turn my head straight real quick, you know. Look again, and you know, just, my heart wants to go. Why? Because I was creating my own righteousness. Doing things to be righteous. Jesus said, you shall be witnesses unto me. He is the truth. The truth is not don't wear this and don't wear that. The truth is Jesus. That's why it's so difficult to witness to the truth completely. Until you get into the Holy Spirit. Because Jesus said the Holy Spirit will lead you into all truth. Get baptized in the Holy Ghost, my friend. And then all these things that you've been worrying about will just die off as insignificant. You know why there's so much love and joy here? Because we're not interested in what you got on. We're interested in who got you on. Amen. Holy Ghost. Amen. Let me tell you, Christianity is the gospel. Christianity and the gospel and the Christian experience or the Christian walk or the Christian life is really a person. Christianity is not a religion, it's a person. The word Christian means Christ-like, like Christ, little Christ. Some people say, uh, oh, you became a Christian, eh? You joined the, the good side. Ain't no side, ain't no other side. If you ain't with Christ, you ain't on no side. You dead. You ain't living yet. Christianity is a person. It is not some denominational tie or some signature on a paper. Christianity is a spiritual relationship with God through Jesus. Now, therefore, you are what you are, wherever you are, whenever you are, with whoever you are, you are a witness. The word is not go witnessing. It says, and ye shall be witnesses unto me. Now, when we are in my past, I've been taught they taught me that you should go rather than be a witness. So they gave us tracks and gave us all these things. They said, go witnessing, brother, go witnessing. Man, I'd go and shove tracks in people's face, and I wasn't a witness. I didn't even know Jesus. 
You see how smart Jesus is? Jesus, when the Holy Ghost come upon you, you ain't got to go nowhere. Just where you are, you're going to show up. The witness of Christ is going to be. I don't have to try to be a Christian. I am one. I don't have to try to be holy. I am holy. I don't have to try to be righteous. I am righteous. The Bible says that we are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Not going to be. So you don't have to try and be a witness. Just be one. Get baptized in the Holy Ghost and you don't have to worry about telling people, hey, I'm a Christian, you know. You walk in there and start speaking the word full of the power of God, laying hands on folks who are sick and talking to the people with the word of power, getting lives changed. They'll say, hey, there's something about you that's different from them other preachers. There's something about you that's different from those other Christians. You talk different, walk different, you talk different. Everything you do is different. And all you got to tell them is, well, I am. Being baptized in the Holy Ghost. Power to be a witness where? On earth. Now this is the basic purpose of the Holy Spirit. Let's turn to Acts chapter 1 verse 8 again. Jesus says, And ye shall receive dynamite after the Holy Ghost comes upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me. Where? In Jerusalem, right in your hometown. In Judea, that's the whole country. Then Samaria, that's the other states. And then all over the world. So you see the baptism in the Holy Spirit power is not for heaven. <laughs> it's for you to be a witness here. The baptism provides an inner power that becomes an outward manifestation. It becomes an outward force that brings the reality of Christ to everyone that meets you. Jesus is the baptizer. And you've got to remember that. Jesus is the baptizer. Now, let's turn to John chapter 15. And this ch chapter in scripture is talking about the baptism in the Holy Ghost and what the Spirit of God will do if you let the baptism release itself in you. John chapter 15. The chief purpose of the Holy Spirit is to testify of Jesus. That's what Jesus just said, didn't he? He says, when you're baptized in the Holy Spirit, he shall, he, he shall make you to become a witness unto me. Uh, before we read John 15, I want to mention a word there in Acts 1 8. He said, he shall be a witness unto me, not for me. I've heard that so many times. I'm just being a witness for Jesus. You can't be a witness for him. He takes care of his own case. Boy, you're getting quiet. Did I say something that rubbed your corn a little bit? Jesus said, not for me. You're going to be a witness unto me. Our whole purpose in life is not to go show folks how holy we could be. It's just to look up at God and say, Lord, you're holy. And you make me holy. And just be unto him. And while you're being unto him, he'll be unto the others around you. Because you just allow a channel of flow of the Spirit's power to come through you. Some of us are so preoccupied by trying to convince the sinner how bad he is that God ain't got time to work on us. Come on. We should just be before God so completely sold out all day walking in the Spirit. Now when people ask us questions, we, we answer them in the Spirit. We are supposed to be witnesses unto Him. In other words, whatever he said, he wants to prove. And he can only prove it if he has an open channel. Now, John 15 verse 26 is then going to tell us about this witnessing that the Holy Spirit is going to be doing. Look at verse 26, John 15. But when the Comforter, the Holy Spirit is come, whom I will send unto you from the Father, even the Spirit of truth, which proceeded from the Father, he shall testify of me. Now, the word testify... It's the same meaning that you find when you go to court. Come on. Now the Holy Ghost is to testify of Jesus. And we are to go around bragging on Jesus. And the Holy Ghost comes to, to let everybody know now what he says is true. 
He is there to prove what we brag on about Jesus. The Holy Spirit is to testify. Let's turn to John chapter 16. And that verse 14. The Holy Spirit, he shall glorify me, for he shall receive of mine and shall show it unto you. The Holy Spirit shall glorify me. We don't worship the Holy Ghost. Who do we worship? The Son. He's the one who died and paid the price. But Jesus sent the Holy Spirit as the power to back up everything he promised. And he says, the Holy Spirit will give you whatever you receive from me. And what, do you re what does Jesus give to his church? All his promises. The Holy Spirit is here to see that they come to pass. John said in Matthew chapter 3 verse 11, John says, he shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. Jesus said, ye shall be witnesses unto me. Now, no one who is baptized in the Holy Spirit is void of power. Everyone that has received the baptism in the Holy Spirit has power. The trouble is, we advertise dynamite, but we never put the fuse to it. It's time for you Christians, all of us, together, who believe and receive that power, to not just always call for somebody else to pray. It's time for you to start lighting your own wick now. Trim your own Latin and say, all right, show me the sick. Mama, you sick? I got the Holy Ghost dynamite. Let me lay my hands on you, mama. Daddy, you got a headache? I believe in the word of God. Let me pray for you, daddy. Jesus says, as many as believed, these signs shall follow them. Not as many that are ordained. He did not say as many that are, are part of the clergy. He didn't say not as many that have entered theological seminaries. He says, as many that believe, these signs shall follow them. They shall lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. Now, this doesn't just happen overnight. This happens through exercise, like Hebrews says. We exercise and exercise until we become sensitized to the power of God. And more of that power begins to flow. Let me tell you, the result then of the baptism is energy. Power and energy. Therefore, this power has to be conducted and controlled. And we're going to get to something that's going to be a little uh, hard for you to swallow, but hang tight with me. Huh? Stay in love with me. If you take a stick of dynamite and put a fuse to it and just throw it over your shoulder, you're in trouble. Huh? All right. You go up to the electrical power pole out there and there's power flowing through that line. And you walk up there and you just put your hands on it. It'll fry you in seconds. But you can go directly to the side of the corner of the building and switch on a current and guess what you controlling all the stuff that's on the wire now you in control the same power is flowing but there is what they call a conductor in that little switch on the wall now a lot of people receive the dynamic explosion of the holy ghost but they have no sense nor teaching nor understanding of how to conduct it do you know that loose power is useless power? Power that is out of control is actually no use to you. Driving your car down here today, that car have all kinds of horsepower on that engine. And I mean, it could probably make 100 miles an hour. But guess what? You're controlling it. You tell it how fast to go, how slow to go, where to turn, you're in control. Now, what happens when your car gets out of control? Disaster strikes. It's the same car you've been driving all year. It's the same power under the same engine in your same car. But guess what? No control. It's destructive to you and to all the other people around you. And this is, this is what I'm getting at. When the Holy Spirit baptism comes upon us, it explodes in our spirits. Some of us just weep. We don't know what to do. 
Some people just began to, like the disciples, they're just speaking another language. Just release that power in another language, in the spirit. Some people haven't been taught how to release it in the spirit. So what they do, when that power comes in them, they jump up, grab onto a chandelier, and they start swinging, shouting. Some others would get up and they'd kick some chairs around and scream and knock people hats off in churches. Don't get me wrong. I believe a lot of those folks really do receive a filling at that time in the spirit. But the church have not taught them. Like Paul had to teach the church at Corinth how to conduct the power of the Holy Spirit in the nine gifts. The power of God when it flows through you is not for you. Oh, when the Holy Spirit baptizes me, I start interceding for people. Oh, I go lay my hands on somebody. You don't sit there and have a little single party somewhere in the corner by yourself and breaking up the church. The Holy Spirit is a spirit of comfort. Amen? Amen. So he doesn't deserve to stay the church and break up the benches that God money paid for. He is in agreement with God. He don't break up chandeliers and break people's backs. The Holy Ghost is for life, not for death. He is on God's side. He is God. Amen. Holy Ghost is not a fanatic. Some people are, but he's not. The Bible says, let everything be done decently and in order. So what do you do with this power then? Dynamite is the same way. You've got dynamite. And for that dynamite to work for you, you've got to conduct it, control it. You don't just walk around the house and light dynamites and throw them in your, in your children's room. You can't play with this. No, dynamite is for a purpose. Amen? The Holy Spirit is for a purpose. What's the purpose? To testify of Jesus. The Holy Spirit baptism is not for you to just shout and scream and, and have a good time and break up benches then to go outside and say, oh, we had such a good meeting. And the person next to you goes back home with cancer. Leaves the meeting still with their problems and depression and you got thrilled in the Holy Ghost. Oh, that disturbs God. We've got to get it right in the church. The power of God is to heal the sin-sick world. The power of God is to come against the work of the devil. The Bible says Jesus came to destroy the works of the devil. And everything else Jesus sends is to do the same thing. Not to destroy your pretty hat. Your pretty hat is not the work of the devil. As a matter of fact, it looks good on you. It has to be the work of God. It makes you look better. Holy Spirit is not here to destroy benches. They look good. Leave them just where they are. If you want to dance, go to the hall. Have a good time. But the Holy Ghost never disturbs the order of the flow of his own spirit. Controlled power. This is what we need to understand. Now, what happened when the baptism was given to the disciples then? They had the same dynamic explosion that the folks say they have in these days. And they jump up and down and scream. So what did they do? They didn't jump up and down and scream. They just lift their hands up, the Bible says, and they began to glorify God in a new language. They began to praise God. In Acts chapter 2, let's turn there a second. Acts chapter 2 tells you what happened when that flame got a hold of that wick. Acts chapter 2 says, And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind. And it filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them tongues like as of fire. Now it wasn't fire in the way that we, it says like as of. Which means they couldn't describe it. Luke, could, Luke was writing this right here. Luke couldn't describe what was happening to them. But he said it looked something like fire. But you see they had dynamite in them. But it wasn't exploded yet. And so Jesus blew from heaven. And the flames just came down and... Notice what it says. And it sat upon each of them. You see, everybody gets baptized individually. God don't have no group baptisms in the Holy Ghost. 
If you don't open yourself to receive it, you won't get it. And the person right next to you will. That's why some people will say, well, how come he got it and I didn't? God don't like me then. Ain't nothing to do with God liking you or not. You know God loves you. He died for you. Maybe you haven't opened up yourselves and get over the fear of raising your hands and just start praying in the Spirit. It sat upon all of them and it says, and they were filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit, you know that capital S there, it's the Holy Spirit that gave them the utterance and there were dwelling at Jerusalem Jews, devout men of every nation, out of every nation under heaven. When they found out about this, they came to check out what was going on up in the room. See, them folks started doing what we're doing this morning. They just started worshiping God. And they wanted, people wanted to find out what was going on. Now, the day of Pentecost means 50. Write that down. That's important to remember. Because this was 50 days after the Jewish Passover. <clears throat> Now the Passover is when, <clears throat> is when the lamb is always slain in Judaism, representing the coming Messiah. That's when they slay the lamb on Passover. Fifty days after the Passover is when they celebrate Jubilee. Jubilee means freedom, celebration. Now, fifty days after Jesus died, you ever wondered why Jesus told the disciples to wait? Because God is never off time. You understand? The Bible says everything in the Old Testament is a type of the testament to come. Talking about Jesus. In the Old Testament, they killed the lamb on the Sabbath. Fifty days after that, they celebrated the freedom from sin and the power of the atonement of the lamb. Jesus says, all right, I'll die. On the Sabbath day, Jesus died. Fifty days after that, he sent the freedom. The Bible says, where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. That's the whole meaning of Jubilee. Liberty. Fifty days afterwards. Now, it came. The Holy Spirit baptized them. And suddenly, it says, there came a sound. Now, it was not a wind, but it sounded like a wind, the Bible says. So don't get confused, you know, but I ain't get baptized unless I hear a wind. <laughs> no, 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 no. It was the initial entrance of the power of God in the earth. That's why the first disciples heard it. It was the first time in history that the, the tongues of flames that would begin the explosion of the power of dynamite entered the universe. It entered our little universe, the world. It was the first time. So there had to be a sound on the first one. But after that, you never hear a sound anymore. Never again did you hear a wind. Peter was just teaching in the house of Cornelius, preaching the gospel to the little people who were gathered there in the fellowship. And while he was speaking, there wasn't any wind. They just started speaking in tongues. <laughs> Why? Because the Holy Ghost light was already in the earth now. The flame is here today. And we got a lot of wicks that haven't been lit yet. And the Holy Ghost is just waiting for you to reach your wick up so that he could set it a spark and that will flow out of you the explosion of the power and from then you will see a dynamic change in your life it was a sound like a wind and it filled the house where they were staying and there appeared unto them cloven tongues like a fire now cloven tongues simply means split tongue it looked like a tongue that was split <laughs> just split in two and it set upon their heads. And they could see it. Why? Because it was the first physical manifestation that ever entered the human race since Adam sinned. As far as the power of God. And they were filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues. As the Spirit gave them utterance. And let's quickly take a look then at what, happening, what is happening here. Let's look at that scripture again. Acts chapter 2. It says that they began to speak as the Spirit gave them utterance. To understand the scripture, we've got to go back to John chapter 4. Please turn there real quickly. John chapter 4 says, Jesus was at the well, resting after a long teaching session and a walk. And he was in Samaria, in 
so-called unclean territory. And he was sitting on the well, a woman came to him, and the woman began to, to uh, talk with him, and he asked her for water and everything, and she refused because he was not of her race, you know. And Jesus said, woman, if you knew who it was who was talking to you, you would ask me to drink. Now watch a revelation. Woman, whosoever drink it of this water, verse 13 to 14, whosoever drink it of this water shall thirst again. But whosoever drink it of the water I will give shall never thirst again. But the water that I shall give shall be in him a well of water springing up into eternal life. Underline the word a well. Please. Because that's important. Jesus says if you drink, if you drink, you shall receive a well. Now here he's talking about the source of the water. He's talking about salvation, not, not the baptism in the Holy Spirit here. He's talking about salvation here. He says, he that drinks of me, or he that believes on me. It's like drinking the water of life. He says, in him all of a sudden shall spring up a well. Now, let me tell you what that means then. You have in you a permanent source of life-giving flow. You don't have to go to anyone now or anywhere else to get some. They're supposed to come to you now. Come on. I want to ask you something. When you want water, who goes to the water? The water comes to you or you go to it? You ever sat down in a chair and says, I want some water. Uh, water, come here. Water, don't do that. You know, in the old days, and some people still have wells today, we had wells in, our, in the back of our yards here in the country. And you, when you wanted water, you had to get out of the house and go and get it. Why? Because the well knew that he was boss, man. He had the stuff you needed. And when you wanted it, you had to come to him. And no matter how much water you dipped out of that well, there was always water there. You ever notice that? Jesus said, if you drink of me, it shall be unto him a well of water. Look at the next word, springing up. That's what a well is. A well is an eternal spring of water. It has a, a source that you can't see, but it just surfaces right where you dig your well. Now that well water is hooked up to water maybe in Russia all through the earth's surface, all the way down to China. But you are drinking water from that source too. And the guy in China is doing the same thing. And the guy in Africa is pulling the water from the same water source under the earth. When you strike a well, you struck the spring. And a spring always springs. Now Jesus says, when you become a Christian, you receive the well of life. And let's turn to John chapter 7 then. And let us read verse 37 to 39. And watch the difference. He stands up on the feast day, the great feast. And he looks at the people and then he cries, If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. He that believeth on me, verse 39, 37, 39, out of his belly, shall flow rivers of living waters. Verse 39 says, And this spake he of the Holy Spirit, which they that believe would receive. Now here's two kinds of water he's talking about. Wells don't flow. You see the picture? Wells stay one place. What flow? Rivers. Jesus said, Secrets of those mules. Every breeze a gentle kiss. In your arms I find my bliss. Every rustle, every sway. In your love I find my way. Autumn symphony, soft and sweet. In your arms my heart's complete. Every note, a tender sound. In your love I am found. 
He that believes in me, in his belly, he shall receive a well. But it says when he starts being baptized in the Holy Ghost, the well, the source of water is going to start flowing. Now what has more power, a well or a river? See, a lot of folks got the well, but they ain't experienced the river yet in their lives. They ain't baptized with the Holy Ghost. You ever seen a well change the, the course of a river? Never. If you put a piece of a cardboard box in a river, just drop it there. That cardboard box will end up on the other side of the country if it follows that river. The river will take it, and if anything gets in the river's way, it moves it. Jesus said the baptism in the Holy Spirit is going to be like a river. It's going to be like a river. Now what about the, the well then? You take the box and throw it in the well, and the box just sit there looking about you. Doesn't go anywhere, just stays there. You see, you could be saved, but catching a lot of trouble. That's what I'm getting at. A lot of people are going to get to heaven, but they're going to be dressed in rags. The devil's going to beat them all the way there. The Bible says the baptism in the Holy Spirit is given that we will have power. You don't need no power in heaven. <laughs> Ain't no trouble in heaven, no power over. You don't need to cast out demons in heaven. Ain't no demons in heaven. You don't need to lay hands on the sick in heaven. Ain't no sick in heaven. The baptism in the Holy Spirit is for earth. We've got to. We've got to get baptized in the Holy Spirit. It's not an option. Jesus said to the disciples, all of them, wait until you receive it. This is a river. Now, the well then is the act of regeneration, salvation, new birth. But the rivers is the infilling of the Holy Spirit, the power that moves things. How can you know then, when you receive the baptism in the Holy Spirit? That is what we're going to deal with next week. How can you know when you receive the baptism in the Holy Spirit? I tell you, everyone in here will receive it. And I won't quit preaching until you do. Because it is necessary. Baptism in the Holy Spirit is for you. You may have the well, but now let's get the river flowing. Let's get that river flowing. And we're going to instruct you, not only on, on how to get the river flowing, because you see, if you got a river flowing, but it's headed straight for somebody's house, uh, you're still destructive. We're going to teach not only how to get the river flowing. Welcome to the sunrise. Another chance to try. Try. Dreams are like the horizon, horizon. Reaching for the sky. Sky, sky Every step a story, story, story. Every breath a fight. Fight, fight In the dance of daylight, daylight, daylight. Chasing the light. Light, light Dance, dance Chasing the light. light Feel the rhythm, hold it tight, tight. In the glow of day and night, night, we're dancing. Oh, we're chasing the light, night. Oh yeah, keep on moving, feel the beat, beat. Hearts are racing, can you feel the heat? In this moment, but how to conduct it and channel it against the devil? That's the one who you want to move out of the way and kill and destroy. How to channel that power towards sickness. How to take that power and channel it towards somebody who you love, who is being destroyed by the devil. How to take it and use it. The same way we take the power of electricity and instead of burning people with it, we get light to read. It's the same thing that God wants us to do with his power. The baptism in the Holy Spirit is not a time for you to have spiritual gymnastics, breaking up the church. It's a time for you to get together as a body of Christ and solve the problems in the world that are attacking the body. Now, let me close with this. That means there are a lot of people 
who have a zeal but no knowledge. You get me? We got some people who may have experienced the baptism in the Holy Spirit, but they turn people off from God by the way they conduct their power. Come on. You don't got to say amen, you know, but I know it's true. I remember I said to myself, me, baptizing the Holy Ghost, never. You see that lady in that church down the road? I saw her jump two benches, fall on her back, and hit her head on the bench. I don't want that kind of stuff. You remember saying that too? And then I began to read the Word, and the Word of God says, the Holy Spirit is a comforter. Comforters don't break your head. Comforters heal the break, the broken heads. The baptism in the Holy Spirit is the explosion of power, but it has the control of the person of the Holy Spirit. It is given to destroy the works of the devil. Amen. Now stand with me. Give the Lord a big hand if you agree with the word of God. Come on. If you're learning something today, just give the Lord a big hand. Hallelujah. 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 Oh, thank you, Lord. We're learning the truth. Set us free. Set us free. Praise God. Praise God. Thank you once again for listening to this message as we hope that it has been a blessing to you. Our goal is to show you new paths and opportunities so that you can discover your purpose. It is your love, support, and partnership that makes Monroe Global possible. Please visit us online at www.monroeglobal.com for more product, partnership, or to join us at one of our live events around the world.